Welcome to Mershman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have a special episode that is a recap of the 2024 post-harvest meeting that we hosted here in West Point. So uh, I hope you all tune in and take a look at how the 2024 growing season worked out for uh, us here in Southeast Iowa. I wanted to thank everybody for their business that, that's buying Mershman products. Um, we're gonna talk about the uh, growing season as Avery alluded to. Um, there's things that are in this slideshow as I was building it over the course of the week that uh, surprised me and reminded me of the, the season we had. So it's always good to go back and look at what we had and what we can do different for the, the coming years. So um, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So this is the drought map from November 22nd, a year ago today. As you can see from the drought map, the areas to the west of us and to the north of us um, we're experiencing D3 drought at that time. We were in the uh, D1 category. Um, you know, we, we had a dry finish to the fall, but, but things change extremely quickly. I just kind of wanted to put that in for, for, for perspective. Uh, this is where we are today. Currently, we are in the D0, so abnormally dry. Um, when we look at this map, and what a thing to note about the drought monitor is they're typically what I would consider two to four weeks behind. They typically took a look at long-term trends. They're not looking at what's in the four inch profile, the foot profile and the four foot profile uh, as quick as like Iowa State and the Mesonet is. So I would consider um, where we are currently at sitting here, Lee County, Tri-State area, um, I would consider us right now, you know, we, we have plenty of moisture. Uh, the, the bank's almost full. Uh, from the, the the rain that we've gotten over the past the course of the past two weeks This is where we started the year off when we started the year off April 2nd. I thought sweet. We are in Lee County, Iowa We have ample subsurface moisture. We are going to get things off to the races and we aren't going to have any issues um, I thought we were extremely blessed when we were starting the year off um, where we are at and and the moisture level that we had but I was uh I was, I was mistaken, unfortunately, because when, I, when we look at what May 21st brings, you can see that that uh, drought monitor had been almost completely wiped out. Uh, like I said, the, the drought monitor is two weeks further behind. So all of the area that was in those droughts, we experienced the same rain that, rain that they did, and uh, it caused some planting issues or some planting delays that uh, definitely impacted yield for this year. So um, we will keep sliding on. This is the map for 2023 for our rainfall totals coming out of West Point. Um, we had a little bit of similarity in the fact that we are above average rainfall in the, the 23 year, but we went through a little bit more drought stress once we got into the May, June, and uh, July timeframe of the 23 crop year. This is the, the map that shocked me when I pulled it up when we were making this. So in West Point, Iowa, we were well above rainfall uh, averages throughout the entire year. So. Uh, the blue graphs, the blue uh, horizontal or the blue vertical lines indicate each individual rainfall. And then we have the black line obviously is the average and then the purple shows the areas where we were above average throughout the year. So uh, here's a GDU map for 23. Um, not a lot there to say other than the fact we were fairly similar uh, with a little bit more heat in the beginning of the year. Um, heat at uh, planting time wasn't necessarily near as much of an issue as, uh, as, as the moisture was. So there's a GDU map, we were ahead of schedule there. Uh, we have planting season temperatures. Um, we have green bars that go horizontally there. At 35 degrees, that's the frost line. So they take air temperatures typically six, eight feet up in the air um, from like, uh, you know, airport weather stations. Uh, so most uh, meteorologists will draw their frost line at 35 or frost potential at 35 degrees. That's where the green line is at because from a microclimate and bottom ground in certain areas, you can actually get frost when uh, the local weather station is reading at a, at a 35 degree level. And then we have our 50 degree line is in the purple and that 50 degree line um, kind of indicates, you know, where we should be from a plant. And we kind of want that 50 degrees and rising when we're planting corn to get the corn out of the ground as fast as possible because we know even emergence is such a key player when we are, uh, when we're trying to get corn out of the ground. So this chart is labeled wrong. This would be our, um, this would be our growing season temperatures. It starts there at June 1st and works its way out through October. One of the things that 
I find extremely interesting and something that has kind of played a key role in building yield the past couple of years is the number of days that we are floating when it comes to a pod fill or a, uh, a corn fill scenario, we are floating um, cooler nights, which definitely helps the corn um, relax from the daytime heat. And then we have very, very few days, zero days in West Point that were over 100 degrees, but uh, or measured 100 degrees. And the uh, the the number of 90 degree days is less than uh, less than five or six when we look at uh, the corn fill time frame. So I think this map is key as to where our corn yield came from this year because the the, the minimal lack of uh, stress you know, when we have high temps overnight over 70 degrees we really start dinging corn yield back during fill when we have high high temperatures during the day um, it can definitely start dinging corn back as well uh, very very quickly but i believe that um, you know, we're all extremely good farmers in this room, but I believe that a huge portion of where our yield came from is because of this chart right here. So let's start the year off. We are looking at the 4th of March. So um, when we look at this picture, we already had green up going on at the 4th of March. I would argue that stuff didn't really ever uh, die off. We had some uh, cover crop wheat out here um, on some of our plots that uh, got a snow on it at the right time before temperatures got cool and when the snow melted the the, the product or the, the the cover crops were still extremely green underneath but we did have uh, a period of time in the february time frame where where stuff did end up browning off just a little bit but this is where green up started and this is probably two to two and a half weeks earlier than we would normally see wheat come out of dormancy so when the wheat's coming out of dormancy so are all of the other weeds and stuff that we are fighting but this is one of the reasons that uh, we were at an accelerated pace with our our wheat harvest this year um, that pushes us all the way to the uh, 13th of uh the 13th of April. Um, this is when on dad's farm, our farm, we, we officially got started. There's a couple guys that may have snuck in a day or two earlier than this. What you're looking at in this picture, I usually do a better job of getting pictures of, of you know, not just the back side of the planter, but we're, uh, we were experimenting or we jumped into the uh, Zyway Thrive 3D system on our planter for uh, uh, season long uh, fungicide uh, protection on on corn so that's what we're looking at here we were experiencing some issues in the field and trying to make sure that everything was calibrated accurately so there you're looking at the foam that uh, that fungicide gets delivered in furrow with so but that was our that was our official uh, that was our official drop our, our flag to start our, our planting season there's my little buddy there's my helper um, we were still planting corn on the 15th is when that picture was taken. Uh, there's, it's always interesting uh, trying to keep him busy when you're uh, trying to stay in the cab. He likes playing with the air vents when it's hotter than hell. And uh, it's, uh, it always keeps things interesting when you got little two-year-olds in the cab with you. So that was the 15th. This is the 16th. And as you can see on the, on the, on the calendar here, we had probably not quite two, ten, or two inches of rain. That knocked everybody out of the field for this year. Um, it was followed by another inch event and then another at least inch and seven tenths event after that. So that definitely uh, put a pause on our planting progress here in, in Lee County. And it's a good thing that we have other things to look at because things get pretty boring when, when I got to stare at Lynn and Dylan and Avery in the office. So it's a good thing we have other things that we're out looking at and, and monitoring, keeping things busy on. Here is a wheat field in Weaver that we are in boot stage on the 23rd of April. Um, this is a field in Fort Madison that you guys are going to see a couple pictures of uh, as, as, as we progress through the season here. But this field actually had started heading out on the 23rd of April. Uh, this is uh, one of Dylan's fields that he had taken pictures of. Uh, they ended up getting beans stuck in the ground. So on the 24th of April, this is 10 days or 11 days after planting, we had to dig a little bit to, to, to find some of the beans. But uh, we, had, we had emergence in, in 10 days on on, on the very, very first planted beans in the county. And as you can see, so that was the 24th, uh, we had some near misses for the, the very, very early beans. And this is the risk that we, that we, we take when we plant early beans, but uh, there's, there's risk and reward in farming. And uh, that I think there was, there was a huge reward in getting the beans in the ground on the first stretch this year, um, even more so than corn. So uh, this is the risk that we play. It never really did quite dip down to, uh, 
32 to get those beans frosted off, but we had a 22nd and 21st uh, definite drop in temp overnight. So 10 days later, all, all this is first planted corn as well. Corn's not quite emerged, but we're real, real close to doing stand counts and figuring out where we are at for the year, how well the planter performed and uh, doing scoring on individual uh, hybrids on, on how fast they're coming out of the ground and how even they're coming out of the ground. Um, this is our second shot of nitrogen that would be going on. So some guys like to split nitrogen on their wheat three different times. You get one in the fall, one at green up, and then the final shot um, for, for high yielding managers like to uh, push, push their nitrogen late to increase test weight and make sure they're not leaching out a bunch of nitrogen um, on, on sandier style fields like what this, this field here is. So there'd be another shot of nitrogen. And I don't have my temperature graph in there where I wanted it, but this is what happens when, when we have cooler temperatures that corn doesn't exactly know which direction to grow. So this would have been an April 14th, 15th planted uh, field. If you remember that those temperatures dropped down uh, significantly and corn started to grow sideways, the roots didn't, the seminal roots didn't know exactly which direction to go, but you know, it happens when we plant early corn. It's, uh, it causes a little bit more of a uneven emergence. It's not exactly what we like to see, but sometimes it's what we get when we are dealing with April, April 14th planted corn. So at the 26th, we were able to start getting good readings as the, um, and ratings as the corn was coming out of the ground. And this is uh, April 30th, and we are looking at a field in Fort Madison. And this is just one of the, my, my favorite things to look at when we are, uh, when we're working with extreme high yielding wheat. So this is wheat drilled in or planted in 15 inch rows with the planter that's right back behind the, the trucks here. Um, 15 inch rows, uh, some guys will say that there's a 5% yield loss and, and, and at, at some points we're okay with that because you know we don't have a drill uh, and, and there's very few drills that are out in the, the countryside for hire. Um, and it's, it's one of those deals that uh, if you have a 15 inch planter, it's not that hard to get backing plates set up and if, if wheat is something that you'd like to try in the rotation on a little bit more marginal ground, 15 inch planters work really well. And we proved that this year, you know, you can raise really, really, really high yielding wheat even in 15 inch rows. So where I'm standing in this picture, you're looking at probably 140 right in this individual spot. The field didn't average that, but this is 140 bushel an acre wheat across the, uh, the monitor when we're running through it. And, and a lot of that, comes from getting set up, having enough nitrogen, having, having balanced nutrition um, in the plant with all the micros and everything, you're looking at a super wide flag leaf. And I know when we're looking at a wide flag leaf and a flag leaf that's, you know, 10 inches to uh, a foot long, you're looking at super, super high yielding wheat and the heads are obviously nice size as well. So that's a huge solar collector. That's where 90% of your yield comes from on wheat. Um, but I knew when we were walking these fields and looking at, this is our Peyton, this is our Peyton 2 product, which is a, a hyper early wheat line um, that we raised on Mershman's ground down in Fort Madison. But I know when we're looking at wheat that's got flag leaves like that, that we're gonna be in some 100 plus bushel wheat, no problem. So we are to May 1st. This would be one of those April 13th or 14th planted fields. Uh, we were out looking, we can actually start to row the beans by May 1st. And uh, in that process, we were out walking around and we saw a few uh, dead soybean plants that looked like this. This is PPO damage. This happens every year. Um, I am a firm believer in using PPOs because PPOs are really, really strong against water hemp. So that would be like your Valor, your Authority products. Um, but you will see this, uh, especially in early planted fields or fields that may have uh, a Levo because the emergence is so much slower. Um, there's a hot zone in the, the very top quarter and eighth of an inch with, if that uh, herbicide hasn't been diluted down into the ground. So as the beans are slow to come through that, sometimes you'll burn the necks of the beans. Um, in this instance, it was probably 1% of, the, of the, the plants that were out there. So there's no yield loss associated with that, but it's always nice to highlight if you guys have any of this ever happen in your field and you wonder what you're looking at. That's basically where the, where the hypocotyl's coming through the ground, it burns the neck on it and it reduces population. So we are at May 2nd. We are already seeing anthesis happen in wheat. This is the time that fungicide gets applied. So we're all looking extremely closely at that. Um, this is again, two to two and a half weeks earlier than we would normally see uh, wheat starting anthesis. So there, there's critical time frame for fungicide. 
Uh, we had some disease show up in the super, super, super sandy spots. This is barley yellow dwarf mosaic virus. Um, typically is vectored in by insects. Um, our insecticide that we have in our seed treatment on wheat usually does a really good job preventing this, but sometimes super stressful conditions or extreme insect pressure can overcome our, our insecticide that's on our, our, our wheat. And this would be an infection that happens in fall. Luckily, there wasn't very many acres of this, but it was on the, the sharp, sharp sand where uh, 30, 40 bushel wheat is about all you get out of it anyway. Um, in some instances, no-till was harder than the hubs of hell to plant through this year. Uh, this is a field that I was walking where we had a really nice stand and I was out trying to do a, uh, a really nice stand in parts of the fields and a kind of a crappy stand in others. And I was trying to do an evaluation whether we needed to do a replant, but you know, that's a corn plant that was planted at a quarter inch to a half inch deep. And uh, where, where, where that was at, you know, stand stand was limited because uh, some of the corn was laying on top of the ground. And this is back, you know, so we, we started not quite a month prior to this, but this, this, is when, uh, this is when planting ramped back up. And this is what happens when uh, you don't clean the planter out and it parks outside during monsoon season. So this is my reminder when, when we started firing back up and that would be the 11th. So we had a little stretch in here. Um, we started here, obviously we got all this rain May 11th rolled around. We have some sporadic, you know, small, small rains. Not everybody got every single one of these. So if for the guys that were willing to push it a little bit and conditions weren't ideal by any stretch of the imagination, that is where one of our second windows opened back up to get corn and soybean planting um, fired back up. One of the problems that we were dealing with at this time, Warren made another entrance there. Uh, my two-year-old helping grandpa out. But uh, one of the things that we were fighting during this time frame too was the, because the, 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 the sprayers hadn't been able to be in the fields for the same reason the planters hadn't been able to be, be in the fields, our winter annuals were one of the worst years for winter annuals that I can ever remember because of the warm weather that we had. You know, if the wheat is starting on May 4th to come out of dormancy, the winter annuals are as well. And when we're in that situation, uh, the, the, the winter annuals were absolutely horrendous this year. So I'm gonna hit the button on this and I didn't realize dad was coming so he's probably not gonna be real proud. This is a field that has uh, wet holes in it and it's got a very, very high water table. And uh, we always fight wet holes in, in certain instances but if this plays through, it's a little jumpy at the beginning but it should catch back up. This is, you know, the 12th of May where we're planting soybeans and I asked dad, I said, well, do we want to drive, you want to put endros around all these little water holes? He said, nope, just keep driving through them. So it's time to go. It's time to get the, uh, the beans in the ground. And this is just perfectly indicative of what we were fighting this year, trying to get, uh, trying to get crops in because the windows were so tight. I, yeah, the windows were so tight that uh, um, it was either we get them in now or are we going to be waiting and doing this in the month of June? So sometimes we, we have, uh, water holes that we unfortunately are farming through or farming around. There we're planting beans on the 12th, so the window's still open. By the 15th, 14th of May, our first planted corn, we kind of sighed a, a breath of relief, you know. Uh, we got corn out of the ground, we got corn in two leaf stage, everything looks good on our first planted crop. The one good thing, or the one, you know, the one bright spot in a very sh crappy wet year when we're trying to get stuff in the ground, um, came, that came out of this year was replants weren't very hard to uh, they weren't very hard to do because the water never shed those lower lying areas of the field and it was extremely easy you know uh, Lynn's went on replants this year Dylan's went on replants Avery's been on replants replants were not a challenge this year because you knew exactly where the holes were at and you went in and either spliced beans in or spliced corn in um, so there's from the 20th I took a quick shot here of wheat um, we're back in this uh, Fort Madison Payton too. One of the things that we, we it's, it's a bigger problem further south than what it is here because wheat breaks dormancy in the south quicker than it does here. But sometimes these ultra and hyper early wheat lines will get frost nipped. So basically as that wheat is shoving its head out of the, the base of the plant and we get a later frost, sometimes we can get just a little bit of uh, uh, frostbite on the heads and that's what that is. That was, there's a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the plants that had that but I figured I'd take a picture of it because that was a really good indicator of what that looks like. Beautiful field of wheat there. 
This is from the Oskaloosa area. I included it in the pictures. It's not necessarily southeast, southeast Iowa where we're at right now, but this was the area, part of the area that was in that D3 drought last year that uh, really struggled with their corn near the prior, the, their corn season the prior year. And uh, we walked into a field of beans that looked all dinged up. Some of the beans were dead. Uh, there wasn't an ounce, there wasn't a lick of weeds out in this field except for on the end rows. And uh, we had two different things going on. And I've been in fields that have HPPD carryover, which is typically what you see with the, the whitening around the edges of the soybean plants. You know, that's, that's your bleaching products like your Callistos of the world. But what was interesting is that we were getting abnormal growth coming out of the cotyledons, which is right here. Typically you won't see an additional um, growing point coming out of the cotyledons. So we have a trifoliate right there coming out of the cotyledonary uh, node, and that doesn't happen very often. So I knew we were dealing with more than, more than just uh, HPPD by itself. So I uh, figured out what was sprayed on that field. It ended up being a resicor. So the stinger is a growth regulator like dicamba and 2,4-D was causing abnormal growth there. And then we had the Callisto um, that was causing the bleaching. Um, it took me a little bit, a couple of days, to talk to a few different people in the industry. And, you know, carryover shouldn't have been that big of a deal because we had so much moisture. But uh, when we have extreme, extreme droughts where, you know, this field's a 200 plus APH and it made in the 130s or 140s the, the prior year. So that shows you how, how, how dry it was that chemicals can, they have an affinity or they bind extremely tight to the soil. So it takes more than normal rainfall to get uh, certain chemicals uh, reactivated and re-diluted through the field so we don't have carryover issues. And that's what happened here was a reservoir application and extreme drought. Uh, it happened um, two years ago over in uh, Champaign County, Illinois. I have documentation that looks very, very similar to what this is as well. So something to look out for in drought, something to keep an eye out on. One of the first things I looked at. Late planted corn, later planted corn from the May, uh, nah, it might have been an early planted line. Uh, we had lots of fertility going on this year. We had lots of rainfall. Um, we saw a lot of tillering this year, which shows that the, that corn plant is off to the races. It's sitting about as good as it possibly can from a fertility, uh, heat and moisture situation. And this is the earliest I've ever seen beans, beans bloom, but we have a June 7th where Dylan documented uh, first planted beans for uh, uh, starting to bloom. So that means we're off to the races and it brings me to Ken Ferry's, my, one of my favorite charts from Ken Ferry that talks about why early planted soybeans uh, push yield. So in, in this instance, and he's got some extremes in here at March 20th, April 21st and May 10th, it all talks about the days that we have um, when flowering begins and the days in the reproductive in the reproductive stage so when we have early planted soybeans that are flowering extremely early um, it allows for more flowering dates and more days in in the reproductive stage which ultimately ends up in yield um, the early planted soybeans from what i can figure were probably at a minimum of 10 bushel per acre better than the may planted beans if not closer to 15 um, over the, the a, a large chunk of acres here locally. And I think this, that graph right there shows exactly why. So by the 10th of May, this is uh, one of the weaver fields. We have uh, wheat that is extremely close to being ready to harvest. This is an ultra early line. This isn't one of the hypers, but it gives all in the same instance. This is a field of milli eight. Uh, you can see we don't have any green all the way down through the canopy. So we're probably sitting at, you know, 16, 17, 18% moisture. This is a map of one of the Mershman fields that, uh, that, that we uh, were harvesting on. So we tried on the 14th, 15th, and 16th to, uh, to get things rolling, but we were still running in that 16, 15, 16% moisture because this hyper early wheat line has to come in here to bins that don't have air on them. We have to have it sub 14, but this field would have easily cut on the, uh, on the 14th of June if we would have had some bins with air on it. So that's definitely a possibility for all of you guys that are even entertaining or thinking about um, planting hyper early wheat and then chasing double crop. June 14th is not out of the question if you have the, the proper equipment. And if not, probably another three or four days earlier than that, if you can take wheat off at 19%, either dry it with air or put it in, or dry it with air, a dryer, or put it in a bin. So there we are on the 21st. 
harvesting. I think we have a couple more pictures there to get us our last. Yeah, so we might have had everything wrapped up. So we had 140 acres on our own farm plus 100 acres of custom work for Mershman's that we did. And by the 21st, I believe we were completely wrapped up with wheat. So um, pretty good year, pretty good year for getting wheat off early. And uh, I don't have any pictures, but a lot of the wheat was running in the 90s to 100 bushel per acre range. And uh, a lot of the double crops were 40, 40 plus in the areas that didn't have too much sand. And that's because we were able to get the wheat off in an early fashion with the hyper and ultra early wheat lines and uh, get those beans off to the right start because they caught rain at the right time. There we got some later planted corn that's kind of in that hip high to uh, getting a little bit taller than that. There's a trial that we had uh, string spring um, strip till versus fall strip till. The stuff on the left was spring stripped and the stuff in the uh, where I'm sitting dead center of to the right was fall stripped. So uh, I think there is some advantage to having phosphate um, and potash in the spring more readily available than letting that tie up over, over winter, which is something that uh, you're gonna hear Peter talk about here um, once he's in the, into the, into the Maristem style of portion of the meeting. Doing some root digs for rootworm. Um, this is in one of the fields where <clears throat> we were using their uh, Revline Hopper Throttle thr Revline Hopper Throttle Guard X, which is the rootworm product that Avery was alluding to, which is the reason that uh, we brought their their entire portfolio forward. But uh, we had some insecticide treated product on the left against some bare Guard X treated product there in a field that had heavy rootworm pressure, and there was virtually no feeding on either side. So the the rootworm pressure, for whatever reason, was. Uh, way less than expected this year compared to the previous growing season. And there's a picture of double crop beans going in the ground on the 22nd. And that was the first time I think our planter saw dust this year. And Dylan, in all of his glory for the second year in a row, had found tar spot on the uh, 24th of June. So you can, it's kind of hard to see right there, but there's the first tar spot that we found. That was probably two days after the first field in uh, central Iowa was found. So um, there were a lot of helicopters, a lot of planes, a lot of fungicide that was applied uh, the week following this because once we found it um, here locally uh, north of town, we were able to go to a lot of different fields and uh, start finding the tar spot because of the environmental conditions that we had. And that environmental conditions would be the rain that we need here in the month of June. And Lynn, I don't know how many days, how many days did we count water on our boots in a row when you walk out through the grass? It was 20? I think 23. Yeah, 23 days in a row we had enough dew in the mornings that you could get a significant amount of water on your boots when you're walking through the grass. So those environments are extremely conducive for tar spot and we were, we were right there ready for lots and lots of tar spot to lay in early. I lied, the 25th was the last day that we harvested wheat. I was off by a couple. Very little disease other than tar spot. Uh, this, is, uh, this would be July 11th. There's just a little bit of gray starting to come into certain fields. Um, also on the 11th there, we're looking at how well pollination had worked. We have a few blank spots. Um, I, it was pretty common this year to have a few blanks, a little bit of scatter fill going on, but you know, we're starting to get excited on our first planted corn on, on what the yield potential looks like. This number here is our 113 day uh, power core product. Um, and we also had quite a few, uh, uh, Mike Wilson, who I don't think is here right now, had brought in quite a few ears that had extra long husks. So for whatever reason, we got, had that scatter fill. If it was a rain at the wrong time to wash pollen off, or if it was some cooler temperatures overnight, um, we had extra long silks this year. I don't really like seeing that. I don't think it ended up being a huge detriment to yield um, this year, but, and it didn't matter which product or which hybrid that we were looking at. I saw this in decalb hybrids. I saw this in Wiffles hybrids. I saw it in our hybrids, but the silks were extra long for uh, whatever reason, whether that be a rainfall event or, or cooler temperatures overnight um, to, to keep trying to push, push fill. But we definitely had brown silk starting by the 11th. Uh, we also had on the early, so this would be a 111 day product. Uh, by the 11th, we were starting to get into, we were past blister, we were into milk. And there's a picture that Mike had that he sent me. So extra long silks. 
and this would be the 17th, so this would be the second half of the, the planting season on, on the corn side. Go to the 20th, that's the same field, similar size ear as what that was. So on our 111 day, uh, it is never very impressive looking. Um, I think I have another picture later on in the season. It's not very impressive looking from an ear size, but it's one of those products that doesn't get huge and long. It definitely packs a lot of its uh, yield by girth, and uh, that's what that product's doing at that point in time right there. Later planted corn, that's 113 day on the 25th. Uh, that, that product is opposite of what we're seeing in the 111 day. There's a, definitely a higher kernel count, but definitely less girth when we're running with the, uh, the 113 day. So they just build yield a little bit different way and we manage those a little bit differently. Because of that, on the 25th, uh, Kyle sent me these pictures from right across the border into Missouri. We got potash deficiency showing up and I wanted to show you guys uh, what the so the potash deficiency is the yellowing around the margins of the leaves. Um, it happens in both corn and soybeans that direction where uh, you're looking at uh, potash not being able to flow to the outside of the leaves. So then you end up getting chlorotic and necrotic eventually over time. This is the the, the Midwest Labs report on a malic of uh, the good areas versus the bad areas. It only shows you know, 20 parts per million difference in the K level, but I would say that both of these products are low and that 30, 29 parts per million difference is what it took to start seeing, uh, start seeing potash deficiency out in that field. That's why when we have product or we have parts per million ranges that are in the 170s, 200s, and what is really more important in, in some guy's mind is having this base, uh, base percentage of potassium over here, that 1.7 and 1.2. If we get these numbers, you know, the closer to four or five we get these numbers, the way less you see issues like this happening out in the field. So um, I would say that we're low on both tests, but that's the 30 parts per million is all it took, which would be, uh, 60 pounds of actual K uh, difference is what caused the problem in this individual instance. So by August 2nd, um, we started seeing sudden death show up and it was probably a little bit sooner than this. I had noticed it in a field or two, but I didn't really want to get out of the truck and confirm it because you know, August 2nd is too early for sudden death to be showing up makes me a little nervous on what it's gonna do from a, from a yield perspective. There's looking down into the canopy. You can see the intervenal chlorosis. It's just picture perfect from what sudden death looks like. Um, I threw a chart in here for the rainfall. I believe one of the reasons that the sudden death in a few of the varieties was as bad as it was is because of the amount of rain that we received right here. So this, this July timeframe when we have two inch rain events, inch and a half rain events, inch rain events. And when, when we have this much moisture, so the way sudden death infects the plant is it infects it when it's probably an inch or two tall. And there is a, it's a fusarium, uh, it's a fusarium fungi that infects the plant and basically colonizes it all year long. And then once we get to pod fill time frame, when that plant is really sucking the, the soil moisture into the plant to help fill pods by pulling nutrients and water in. It's pulling all of those toxins in with it. And when you have that huge influx of toxins is when you get the, the, the disease symptoms that you're looking at there. So on years when we have little rainfall events that build into that time frame that keep the soil moist and uh, allow for enough pod fill to happen, um, we don't see the sudden death near as bad because you're spoon feeding the rain as it comes. But in years where we have these inch, inch and a half, two inch rain events, uh, there's actually an affinity between water and dirt because uh, the drier it is, the tighter the water binds to the, uh, the soil colloid. And when that, that soil colloid um, has free flowing water, the plant will actually luxury, luxury consume that water and bring, bring the nutrients in with it. So when we are at field saturation level or field capacity level, um, the plant will actually pull more water in, pulling more toxin in. And that's why sudden death was worse on, on certain acres this year. Or yeah, sudden death was worse this year than what we've seen in the past. And I believe a lot of that has to do with planting date and cool conditions. And then the amount of rain that we received in the month of July. So this is a field of uh, Lincolns that we had. There's three numbers in our book that, uh, that we recommend using Salteron if you're gonna be planting it and there's any sudden death history in it at all. Um, 
it's a Lincoln, uh, Truman, and a Austin because all of those scores are a little bit less than average. Um, I had seen peppering in the Lincolns before. So we've been around that bean for three years now in test plots. I've seen just a plant or two get sudden death, but I've never seen it to the field scale that we saw here. So there's a direct division line right here. These are McKinley's on this side, Lincoln's on this side. Lincoln's definitely got beat up by sudden death. And an interesting picture here is this is Lincoln's on one side of the road, Lincoln's on this side of the road. Uh, probably not quite a month difference in planting. These are planted April, early portion of April. These are planted early portion of May. And uh, that goes to show, you know, products that have sudden death uh, weaknesses um, definitely get hammered harder when, when soil temps are cool and rainfall happens. That being said, the Lincolns is one of the best beans that we have in the lineup. Uh, I can say that this field across the scales that had the sudden death history in it uh, averaged right at 80. So the areas that didn't have sudden death were extremely high yielding to be able to hold that average. So um, I'm not afraid of planting the Lincolns. Um, if it's wet and cool and it's early April and sudden death is, uh, is definitely a, if there's an option for sudden death to happen, I'm probably uh, not planting the Lincolns first. But still 80 is an extremely respectable yield for the year that we had this year. Um, there we are, later planted cornfield by the 21st of August, we're in milk line. This is a picture of Dylan. Dylan doesn't like his picture taken, but this is a picture that Joe shot. Um, we were actually in a field day. Um, can't exactly remember where. It might have been the Des Moines area, but Corteva's working on short corn. So Bear and Corteva are both working on short corn. That's something that you guys get to uh, look forward to or, 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 or think about in the next five to 10 years. That's where the industry thinks they're heading. I've been down that road. Um, I'm gonna be skeptical until we see it work. Um, so just a, a, a comment here, this was the first tar spot that we saw show up. So when we, on, on our own farm. So when we look at what that Zyway did, I believe that Zyway had a huge impact and we're looking at this field as a corn on corn field that uh, was strip tilled. So there is lots and lots of heavy residue that is there. Um, uh, we've had tar spot in the past. It's, it's, it's a 50 bushel yield loss and when, when we get it early and, and we, we've seen those on our own acres, if you remember last year's meeting. But you know, when, when Dylan saw stuff at the end of June and we're seeing our first tar spot specs in the middle of uh, August there, uh, that Zyway is a product that works and I, it's a product that I believe has a, a lot of validity if, uh, if you can get it built into your program somehow. There we have some critters working on alfalfa on the 20th of, uh, or the 19th of August. There we have some early planted corn uh, that would become from a bare genetic side of things where tar spot was hammering stuff awfully early on the 19th. The 27th, we had uh, Southern rust come in. Obviously this is late stage Southern rust. So you could probably put seven to 10 days earlier. We would have had leaves that looked way closer to this than this, but, but rust is definitely something that you guys need to be looking at the rust scores in, in seed catalogs, because I think the rust took a little bit of the top end off of our crops this year. Um, there should be another slide in there. It's not, I think a lot of this was stirred up by barrel hurricane barrel that came up. Yeah. We didn't necessarily get, the rainfall that was associated with that disease, but southern rust is a rust that has to come up on the spores fly with the wind. And uh, when you have uh, a hurricane style event like that, that is blowing up through, it mixes everything up in the atmosphere. And even though we may not have received the rains, um, that I believe barrel, I thought I had that slide in here. I believe that was started uh, like the 8th through 11th of July. So there's plenty of time there for that disease to slowly work its way, way north and, and start infecting things. But when you have hurricane events like that, typically we watch um, the states like uh, Louisiana and uh, Arkansas and Southern Illinois. And, and usually we have about two weeks before we start seeing those disease progress north if we have southerly, southerly movement of winds. This isn't from Lee County, but uh, this is, this is uh, out in Nebraska. And, and this just highlights one of my favorite numbers that we have in our book, which would be the 2512, it's 112 day, that's brand new. Some people say it's one of the highest yielding products in the industry right now. Um, 
this field was an irrigated field in Nebraska planted at 33,000 and it just had monster clubs hanging off of it and uh, Dylan and I were out at a field day and I thought we had to definitely take some pictures of that because the 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 2512 is one of the best numbers in the industry right now and it we'll talk about that in a little bit so this is the same field of dads that had tar spot uh, show up on the 13th this is just what the progression looks like from two weeks tar spot has a two-week latency period so the plant is already infected you cannot see the black pustules uh, two weeks before that black pustule shows up, it was already infected. So you, it, you know that there is a huge amount of inoculum already out there when you see the first specs. That's why it's so important to get fungicide on either ahead of any time that you see the specs or, um, or right at the first sign of tar spot because it progresses extremely quickly. So when we took those pictures, a lot of these spores would have already been on that plant. There's the 112 day again, that is local. Uh, just north of West Point. Um, this is another one that I have not seen since I started my career here locally, but a lot of the guys that have been farming longer than, you know, 15 years. This is uh, northern corn leaf blight. This was over in central Illinois. So the disease is still around. It's just not something that we have had to face here locally in the past 10 years. This is another shot of that 112 day. We went to uh, a field day and uh, they cut all the tops off on the border row just to show the, the flex and the, the yield out of that product. Um, October 9th, so we're getting to the end of the season here. Uh, Burlington, Iowa, Craig Pulpier and I went up to a field that uh, customer was just a little bit nervous about, um, yielding not quite the same way that he wanted it to. So uh, Craig had seen or heard that uh, some other fields in Burlington experienced white mold. This field is the only plant that I could find that had white mold in it, but white mold is, is definitely here. One of the things that makes Mershman different than the rest of the industry is we will put Heads Up, which is a seed treatment that treats against white mold, um, standard in our starting line seed treatment. So we should, from, from a seed perspective, from a seedsman's perspective, we're giving you everything, the best products on the industry to stay ahead of problems like white mold. White mold in Southeast Iowa is like a one in 10 year problem. And it used to be that way in central Illinois too, but it's like an every other year problem now. So this is something I'm keeping my eye out on. We're starting to do disease ratings on white mold into the mid group threes. It's something that a lot of the early twos and mid twos have, have defense against, but uh, this is something I'm keeping my eye out and MS Technologies is working on uh, rating and scoring different products for white mold in the mid group threes. And this is another field where a customer wasn't, um, wasn't, wasn't excited about, you know, we had to go out and do an autopsy. This is a big problem that they had in uh, central Illinois this year. Uh, we did have a little bit of it. I wasn't aware of it. Um, some of the guys from Chemgro ended up being in the same field, it was the same similar customer that we shared, and uh, there was some aphid damage. Um, I hadn't heard about any huge pressures here, here locally, but uh, corn aphids will uh, basically uh, pierce the, the, the outside cuticle of the corn leaf. They'll pull, they'll pull uh, sugars out and they'll leave a honeydew uh, residue on top of that leaf. It's, it's pulling sugars away from, the, from the, the sink, which would be your ear, which is where we want all the sugars to go. So they're pulling things away from the, the, they're pulling sugars away from the ear that we would want to be going into the ear and causing stress during fill, which, which doesn't help. And I think we also had some help from the deer in this picture here as well, but um, definitely something to keep an eye out on. Um, not a pro huge problem that we had this year, but obviously we did have a little bit of pressure from corn aphid. So quick yield recap. I'm not going to spend as much time on the soybeans because Merchman's is kind of known for their soybeans. Um, but we have some really, really exciting things coming down the pipe. Uh, this is a product that was raised right across the river. I pulled it out of South America for increase line last year. It's, its name is 2635. It doesn't have a presidential name yet, but uh, the grower was joking around Kennedy replacement. I get disappointed when I see 89 bushel on acre. Uh, this is 121 acres averaged uh, 100 bushel on acre. So we have some step changes coming in the mid group threes, I think. Uh, and we're gonna talk about another product next here, but uh, 
there are a couple products that are extremely high yielding that I think are gonna be step changes. Once they get into our book, I see them as products that'll be in the lineup for four, five, six, seven years, kind of like the Kennedy was, because the Kennedy was definitely a step change. Uh, our our 3.6 was definitely a step change uh, when, when the Enlist uh, was launched. Here we have a field of Monroe's, uh, 155 acres, averaged 88. So when I look at the 26, 35, and I look at our 25 series Monroe, both of those products are 107, 108, 111% in three different tests. Both of those products mirror each other that they are some of the highest yielding elite genetics that uh, MS Tech is working with, that Mershman Seeds is working with in the industry. So um, that's a lot of acres to average 88 bushel an acre this year. I believe these were planted at uh, 80,000 because I had limited seed supply. So uh, that's pretty darn impressive. I don't think we're losing yield from lack of population there. Here's another uh, John Deere Ops of a new product as well. Uh, we're working very hard on bringing more Peking lines into our system. So uh, this is a Jefferson 2533. So it's a 3-3 maturity. It's got a Peking strain to it. So it's extremely effective against soybean cyst nematode. And uh, there we had 90 acres, average 92 bushel an acre. So uh, these are some of the newer products that are in the lineup. These are some of the products that are coming. Some of the products that are available for sale right now. These are some of the products where us as a team at Mershman's are really excited about. Um, so keep your eye out for those when uh, you're looking to buy seed. Also April planted, I don't think that one was planted at 80,000. I think it's probably planted a little thicker than that. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time because I don't like going to meetings where all we do is talk about product, but I wanted to talk to you guys about our corn. So this is 35 different locations in a full season uh, rep. I don't conduct these studies. Uh, the people we buy our genetics from conduct these studies. And when we look at 113 day to 119 day, this is that 2512 that was talking about that was throwing those monster ears. So this is east, central, and west, western data. So basically how we break that apart is anything west of I-35 is western data. Anything east of the Illinois line is eastern data. So we would fall in the central, which is important for you guys. But I kind of wanted you guys to see from a whole footprint, you know, the Mershman lineup is extremely, extremely strong lineup. Products like 6599, 6595 are two huge ones that, that growers know by, by name in the, out of the decal camp. And our first generation uh, power core products are keeping up. Our second generation power core products are doing extremely well against products that are well, well more uh, later season. You know, they're, they're definitely later products. Later products have a tendency to skew higher yielding. And then you have this 112 day that sticks out like a turd in a punch bowl because it is just an absolute dominant product. We move to the central data. You see the same thing. You can see the yield differences here on the side. We're still hanging in where I think we need to hang in. Uh, we can build a package, and, and what I guess I'm getting at is we can build a package with two or three different hybrids that we can keep up with the, the two majors is Pioneer and Decalb. So um, when, when, when we put those, when we put our packages together, there's nobody in the industry that I don't think that we can't keep up with, run and outrun from a, from a yield perspective. Uh, that's the, the big data, so central, east and west. Again, 112 days on top, 111 is no slouch, 113 is no slouch. 111.35 is probably one of the most popular products that uh, Decalb talks about in that range. Um, you can probably recognize some 1212 here. Uh, again, we're hanging in where we need to hang in. There's the central data. We're within two bushel on the 111. I think that's awesome. This is 20 different locations in the central region. Planting the package, planting these three products, the 112, 111, and 113. I don't think you can go wrong. Here's some earlier data, 106 to 112. There's the stud of the industry, which is Pioneer 1027. Obviously, we're a little bit later. You look at the moisture difference from 20% down to 18.9, but we are still holding our own there. We have a very, very, very strong 106 day. That's doing extremely well. Central data. That's why I'm talking about that product right there is a stud. It beat us by two bushel an acre, even though it was drier, but we still have products that are in the realm and able to compete when we build the portfolio and the package. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, 2024 post-harvest recap of our, our 2024 growing season. This time of year, we have a lot to be thankful for, and I wanna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll see you next week.